Hello, everyone. My name is Brittany Kerfoot, the Deputy Director of Events at Politics and Prose Bookstore, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. Just a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin. First, due to the nature of this discussion, if you say something offensive or triggering in the chat, you will be removed from the event. We want this to be a place of open discussion and discourse, but there are some things that won't be tolerated, so please just think before you type. Next, I will be dropping links in the chat in just a bit where you can purchase any of tonight's books straight from PNP's website. And if you don't wanna wait for shipping, you can select in-store pickup and you can retrieve it from any one of our three store locations around Washington, DC. And finally, you can ask any of our speakers a question tonight by clicking on the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. And while we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the latter part of the program, um, we apologize in advance if we don't have time to address your specific question. Okay, on to tonight's event. I am so excited to introduce tonight's guests as the topic of consent and reframing the conversation around sexual assault is something I'm very passionate about. The three women here tonight each bring a unique perspective to this issue, both through their extensive research and their own lived experiences. First, Allison Wood is an award-winning writer who teaches creative writing at NYU and is the founder and editor-in-chief of Pigeon Pages, a New York City literary journal and reading series. Her memoir, Being Lolita, recounts the predatory relationship she was in with her high school English teacher and traces her metamorphosis from student to survivor. Next, award-winning writer and public health executive Michelle Bowdler is the author of Is Rape a Crime, a book that indicts how sexual violence has been addressed for decades in our society, asking whether rape is a crime, given that it is the least reported major felony, least successfully persecuted, and fewer than 3% of reported rapes result in a conviction. Finally, T. Kira Madden is the founding editor-in-chief of No Tokens and a facilitator, a facilitator of writing workshops and homeless, for homeless and formerly incarcerated individuals. Her memoir, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, spans from 1960s Hawaii to the present day struggle of a young woman mourning the loss of her father while unearthing truths that reframe her reality. So please help me welcome these three amazing writers to PNP Live now. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much, Brittany. You're so welcome. Okay. Hi. Um, <laughs> I'm so honored to be here um, with these exquisite books. And that introduction was so beautiful. But I did want to just acknowledge before we begin that uh, for the sake of time, I will be asking you both the same questions. But I, I really wanted to, to lean into this idea that these are very radically different and individual books. Um, and I think one of the many tactics uh, used, especially in literature, is this idea that, you know, the story has been told already. The story doesn't need to be told anymore to, sit, to group us all into this monolith. So thank you for, for offering such radically different, beautiful books in their own right. And I'm only asking you the same questions because we are sharing the space to honor beautiful mosaic, as Michelle has so eloquently said in her preface to the book. Um, and again, I'm so honored to be here. I was hoping that both of you could maybe read from your books to give us a sense of that, uh, the tone and the pacing. And I'm really nervous. I'm like, so happy <laughs> to be here. Um, well, thank you. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I I guess I'm supposed to read first. I, I wanted to say, first of all, thank you to Politics and Prose and also to T. Kara because um, we're both uh, huge fans of your work and really appreciate you taking your time and such a, a busy time for you as, as a writer. And also, I want to say this is Allison's book launch. Um, her book came out on Tuesday and um, it's really exciting and this is her first event. So I just want to acknowledge that before I just start reading myself. So congratulations, Allison. Okay, so I'm gonna read a short passage and um, my book is a memoir, but it also contains some research. And I chose a passage that has a little bit of uh, a narrative quality. 
It takes place when I'm heading to Washington, D.C. to the Department of Justice, and it's my first real foray into a, a national advocacy platform. And I was very, very nervous. And this is just a couple of pages about that event. And I'm going to try to do it so I'm not doing this. Okay. The Department of Justice Sexual Assault Roundtable was scheduled midweek, and I had taken two days off from work to attend. In less than 24 hours, I would be sitting in a circle in a windowless conference room with 12 strangers, other rape survivors, along with close to 20 government officials and law enforcement authorities who would sit in chairs directly behind us. We're here to listen, the moderator would say when we took our places. Later, when the day concluded, they would say they were grateful and that we were brave. We were brought together to address the complexities of notifying victims that forgotten forensic evidence was being tested in cities across the country and entered into the national DNA database. I didn't yet understand why a tool that provided the highest standard for matching a perpetrator to a crime was available but remained underutilized in rape cases, even with legislation written and funding allocated for that specific purpose. More reform was needed the compel than compelling crime labs to test the old rape kits and enter them into the DNA FBI database. Analysis of what caused this state of affairs was needed, or else it seemed likely that victims raped in the present day would be speaking out about their ignored cases 20 or 30 years from now, and someone would be thanking them through their tears for their courage. The National Center for Victims of Crime, a co-sponsor of the event, had sent an email that included an attachment with a personal narrative from each of the attendees in which we described our assaults, as well as any encounters we had had with the criminal justice system. The moment the email arrived in my inbox, I printed the attachment and closed my office door. The stories described shocking levels of violence and terror, and yet, in a way that made me feel ashamed, I was giddy. Until this moment, I had never met anyone who experienced anything like the violence I had, and this fact had left me feeling deeply lonely. I believe no one else could understand what that felt like and what it took for me since I barely understood it myself. But now there were others, a little group. Groucho Marx's line, I wouldn't want to be part of any club that would have me as a member, went through my head. It felt like my bare foot had found a missing puzzle piece on the carpet. I couldn't wait to meet them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. So, Allison. You're up. Okay. And um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Well, first thing is I want to thank T. Kira Madden for being here and her beautiful book. Um, the paperback isn't quite as, uh, you know, literary, but the paperback is still beautiful. And um, you can get it here at Politics and Prose, and it's so amazing. And Kira, I'm just so honored and grateful that you're willing to do this. And then, Michelle, your reading was so beautiful. And like, I just have to say like, this book is so important and good. And it is like going beyond everything that you think it is. And like, I, whenever I keep talking about it, I keep saying <laughs> to answer the question, I'm like, you know, the book is called Is Rape a Crime, which is such a provocative, wonderful question. Um, and my answer is always, well, yes, but the problem is we don't treat it like that in our society in our socially constructed culture and the way that we talk about gender. And that's why this book is like, just, it's so great and it's so well written. I'm just so, I'm just so grateful to you both for like sharing Thank you. with me. I'm just, I'm so excited. So I'm just going to, I'm Allison. I'm <laughs> just going to read the opening of um, Being Lolita, which just came out this Tuesday, which is exciting because it's so strange to be like, I have a book. <laughs> Michelle, you've just gone through this. Your book came out last week. It's yeah, it came out last week. wild, right? To be like, yeah. here it is. <laughs> yeah. Very strange. Here it is. Yeah. 
So I'm just going to read the opening and um, yeah. Being Lolita. The first time he kissed me, it wasn't on the mouth. I hadn't read the book yet. He told me it was a beautiful story about love. We would meet in the next town over, a diner off the highway, open all night. I would know what time to meet him in our booth in the back corner because in the middle of his class, in front of everyone, he would look at me, look into my eyes, and write a number on the blackboard, eight or nine or 10, and then wipe it away with his other hand. He was an English teacher in my high school. His shirt sleeves were always chalk kissed with white. He was 26. The first time he saw me, I was 17. I would tell my parents I was going to a friend's house or studying somewhere, but really, I would be sitting across him for hours, the pastel painting depicting Greek ruins on the wall above him, where, while he would grade his students' essays and I would sometimes do my Latin conjugations. Mostly, I would write to him, in front of him, and he would bring it home or sometimes read it there under the 24-hour fluorescence and then write back. All over napkins, the paper placemats, scraps from school. We probably covered hundreds of pieces with cursive, but I have only the handful that I hid from him, kept close and stolen away. Before we would leave, he'd take the papers and napkins and rip them up, put them into our water glasses, and I would watch them lose their shape and the ink bleed. I wasn't allowed to keep things. I wasn't supposed to call him Mr. when we were alone, only his first name. But I could never call him that in school. No phone calls, no emails, no touching. He made the rules. The rules were broken at that diner in our booth. It was May. Summer was almost there and graduation hung in every classroom. Crepe paper and glue glitter banners filling the halls a countdown everywhere. You couldn't escape it. He was trying to teach me about great literature, to prepare me for what I would face as a freshman in college just a few months in the future. You should definitely be an English major, he told me, leaning back into the booth, his arms stretched out on top of the bench, taking up so much space across from me. It was the pose that if we were on a date, unseen in a dark theater, would be the transition movement before he put his arm around me. He wouldn't bother with a fake cough. He'd just go for it, I was sure. He would read me the greats at our table of beige formica and dull silver. Poe, Dickens, Hawthorne, Carol. He'd get into it, doing voices when he read Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, laughing at literary jokes that I was surely supposed to understand, so I laughed too. I laughed it up knowing how lucky I was to have this kind of private instruction. That night, he was reading Lolita to me from the beginning of things. He spoke to me in Nabokov's opening lines, languidly, light of my life, fire of my loins. I thought it was the most romantic thing ever, but I was ruining it. I had a bug bite and I kept pushing my ankles together, trying to quell the tinge of itch a child who couldn't sit still. He began rubbing the edges of the pages with his thumb, harder and harder as his voice grew louder, creating tiny rips in the paper as he stroked them. Finally, he asked, a mosquito bite? Yes, I said, an invisible ruler against my spine. Don't you have any calamine lotion? Not on me, I said. You know, he said, saliva can stop the itch. He looked at me. He had green eyes. My flip-flopped feet were on the cracked red leather next to him on the booth, my legs under the table bridging the gap between our benches, not touching, just beside him. I followed the rules. He leaned down to my foot next to him and put his lips on my pink, swollen ankle. I felt his breath on my skin. And it was like every locker in the halls of my high school swung open at once metal kissing cinder block walls. It felt just like that. That's the opening. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, thank you both for those stunning readings. Um, I'd like to 
with a topic like this and with books like yours, I think it could be, uh, we could easily get carried away in the content from the get-go. So I, I'd really like to take a moment to just compliment the enormously gifted craftsmanship of these books and talk about craft a little bit. Um, both of you cho chose a three-act structure, which I found really interesting. I did the same in my book. Um, Nymph, Capture, and Dissection for Allison's book, Memoir, Investigation, and Manifesto in Michelle's book. And I'm curious about how you arrived to that three-act structure. Um, in a recent interview, Allison, I read with you, you talked about reclaiming the hero's journey, which I found really fascinating uh, and a different way to, to think about the structure of your book and how the classroom itself is this return to home that you've set up. Um, as someone obsessed with structure, I had missed that myself, that you do make that return. Um, so I'm curious about the three-act structure and also how, how and when you found that greater framework for your stories. It's not just the, this is what happened, but as, as the author Amy Hempel would say, it's, it's the what of it. It's the what now. How do, we, how do we make meaning or sense of the unfathomable or the intolerable? Yeah, Michelle, do you do you want me to, who goes first? <laughs> Why don't you go first and I, I and we'll switch around. Okay. Um, my choice to do a three act structure was in part because, well, I think you both know structuring memoir is really tricky um, because it's not always necessarily going to be chronological. That's not how memory works. Um, and I think structuring memoir can be especially hard. Structuring, just structuring books I think is hard, but I think memoir can be especially tricky in some ways. And I was really struggling for a long time with like how to structure the book. Um, I felt like I wanted it to be chronological, but I sort of didn't know beyond that. Um, and then I was rereading Lolita for like, I don't know, the billionth time. And <laughs> I suddenly realized like, oh, this is the exact same narrative arc in a lot of ways. I mean, to oversimplify, part one of both books is this sort of grooming, predatory, preying upon, sort of setting everything up. The break between part one and part two is when they sleep together for the first time, when Humbert rapes Dolores and, you know, when I graduate from high school. And um, part two is sort of this extended series of road trips and trying to not be found out and to escape and then ending up in another school. And it's so funny because even going farther, um, I read, I eventually realized that um, I read somewhere in one of the Nabokov books, the mini Nabokov books, um, that Berkeley uh, is supposedly based on Ithaca, which is where uh, Nabokov taught for a long time. Um, you know, he was a lepidopterist, he studied butterflies, and he also taught literature, and he taught at Cornell. So Berkeley, where they end up for a while, where Humbert and Dolores Dolores, is, Lolita's real name is Dolores, for those of you who don't know, so I try to refer to her as Dolores. Um, they end up there, and I was just, oh, that's basically what happened to me. Um, but then the difference is that, spoiler alert, in the end of Lolita, everybody's dead. Uh, <laughs> Dolores is dead, everyone's dead. I didn't die, so I was like, well, I get a part three. <laughs> right sort of really that simple for me. I was like, well, I get a part three, I get to go on, you know? And then for the hero's journey, that was something that I realized, I, that I really thought about consciously when I was trying to find the ending. Because I feel like a lot of times with women's memoir, I feel like, Kira, we've talked about this. With women's memoir, there's sort of this expectation of like a happy ending involving marriage and, you know, having children and like creating this sort of like, you know, like the family, the relationship that's a happy ending, I think, especially in like a trauma, in a trauma related memoir. And I think I have a happy ending, but it doesn't involve a dude. You know, my, my cats are my children who you might see running around in the back at times. My, my students are, um, you know, who I care about. And do you know what I mean? So I realized that, well, that's not going to be my structure. But then I realized, well, I end up in the classroom again. And that's where I started. But it's literally the opposite. So, yeah. Great. Michelle, how did you get there? So, I had my memoir structured as pure memoir and all chronological. And it wasn't the full story that I wanted to tell. And it really took me uh, 
the revision process to figure out that I wanted to add the research and change the structure. And what was really essential to me in the book was that I, I wanted to show the juxtaposition about of what a of what somebody uh, what a, a, a victim of sexual assault and and rape experiences uh, post the assault and juxtapose it with police inaction and bungling and neglect. So I actually had an example of that that fits into my memoir, but I decided to do it in three pieces to sort of say, okay, here, part one that we're calling, I mean, the, the whole thing is actually a memoir and pieces of it are investigation. And the whole thing really is leading up to a call for action, but we did structure it that way ultimately into three parts. And so when, by the time you get to part two, you really do see a prolonged uh, response, a trauma response that is, is, is devastating I think both to um, the character Michelle. I mean, I, you know, I think of I think of us as characters in the book, although it's about us. Oh yeah, and uh, that's what that's what my instructor taught me. And 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 then part two is the piece about this person changing away from feeling like her life is destroyed into. Uh, let me see if I can figure out what happened, and if perhaps part of the inability to move on has to do with the lack of response and the, the really uh, neglect on the part of the of, of law enforcement and so the second part really examines that not just for me but for a number of people in our in our society and so it isn't it's one story but it's also many and then by the end i really felt like I needed to have, I mean, I'm calling it a manifesto and a call to action, but it's also an acknowledgement that, um, that there is the possibility of meaning and hope and love and joy in someone's life. And it doesn't take away from the need to make sense of an experience and try to make meaning out of it. And the manifesto is, is really that, sort of saying what we're left with in our society is not acceptable and we need to all think about ways to do something about it. It doesn't answer to the question. It doesn't lay out a 500 page, this is exactly how we're gonna do it layer by layer, but it is, it is the beginning of, you know, if, if this is an outrage to you, let's all work together to make change. And so that's how I, you know, it came up with the structure over time. Yeah. Something that I love about all of our books, actually, um, is that all of our books don't end at what could traditionally be the ending of that story, you know, like the yeah. trauma story of like, oh, and this happened and bam, that's it, you know. Instead, I think it's so wonderful that all of our books, all three of our books really do examine the after because right. so often that story isn't told you know it's up to the horrible thing and then mm, you, right. you don't really know what happens to these women to these people um right. i actually don't mind the word victim i don't know actually i'm curious about how both of you i like i like the word victim yeah. because to me it innately suggests a victim of something mm -hmm. you know what i mean like i'm very into just sort of like the grammatical word victim because yeah. i think that there is power in acknowledging this was done to me mm -hmm. you know i i did not do this i was not the actor i was not the aggressor this was done to me so mm -hmm. i actually find the word victim very empowering and i know you've talked about this too and in yeah. you know, past nonprofit world i worked with um the national victims advocacy advocacy group and some things when i was working with teenage girls mm -hmm. so i like the word victim i think it's Inter I think it's good. So yeah. how do you I, feel about it? I, I, I agree completely. And I think I have, I, you know, people can choose whatever fits them. But I, in the book, I feel like the word survivor is a way that lets other people off the hook from their own discomfort, right? Like you survived. So, okay, good. I, you're, you're good now, right? You're a survivor. Woo and I, I, it really 
bothers me. And I think when you say there's a, a, a piece of being a victim, you are saying that what was done was serious and devastating and not so fast to yeah. just say, you know, you're a survivor, you're brave, you're courageous, good for you. And then, and then we're all good. And that, that really makes me mad. So I do actually prefer that term, even though once in a while in the book, I'll use survivor just because I couldn't use victim so many times, but I also have a preference for it. I don't know about you, T. Kira, what do you, what do you think? I use them interchangeably, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I try to ask people when they're telling these stories what they prefer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, I think it's a really interesting conversation and it, it kind of leads into my next question. Um, Michelle, I like that you talked about the character of Michelle and I think the same way of this, this character projection of the self, it's not, you know, the full version of the self nailed to the page. Of course, that wouldn't be possible. What I found really striking in both of your books is how you both splinter narrative into these kind of alternative versions of the self. Um, there's this idea in Michelle's book of, you know, the me of one week ago, how this person would have acted. Mm -hmm. um, Allison, an example of yours, is the Allison who would be in the fairy tale or the other version of this story, the Annabelle Lee, the person who would end up, the Dolores who might end up dead, um, or the fairy tale princess. Um, and there, there is this sense of past, present, and future selves in both of your books, even with the photograph in yours, Allison, that you refer back to seeing it through this new lens. And I actually felt that both of your third acts, for me, while not explicitly, they're very much present, felt like future tense sections. Um, it kind of kicked a door open for me to see who those characters and what those worlds might look like moving forward. Um, so I'm curious, it's, it's almost a non-question, but how you, how you thought about this, this idea of the splintered selves, if it was uh, kind of a tool to write about trauma and what trauma does to the consciousness and to the body. Um, if you thought about that way at all, I don't want to project that on you, uh, but I thought you both treated character um, with such dynamism and such beauty. If you could talk about that. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle, why don't you go first this time? We can, we can swap. Sure. <laughs> I, I, I think that uh, so much of trauma has a fracturing of self and um and i did want to capture that i don't know that i did it on purpose or if in fact it just represented what my life had felt like and as well i also wanted i mean people who've read this book a couple of people who i work with have have said to me um i didn't know I had no idea that you felt this way or that you were going through this. You put on a, you know, you put on a good act or some, some sort of expression like that. And, and I was thinking that it, it didn't feel like an act that, that, that I think when you are a, a trauma victim or survivor, you often feel like you are showing different parts of yourself to different people for very good reasons. And some of it is really um, for self-preservation. And I talk a little bit in the book as well about having children and having to make decisions about when it would even be appropriate to talk to them about what I had been through. And so, you know, what I put forth as a parent wasn't a false self, but it wasn't my full self, which, which was fine and appropriate. And so, um, and so I'm, I'm really glad I'm really glad that came out as in reading both of our books, Tikura, because that I think writing writing it mattered to me in that way. I wanted I wanted that to come through because it it does really capture I think at least the experience for me. I can't say what everybody else's experience is, but I, I'm I'm glad it was felt by 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 you as a reader. Very much so. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I completely agree with so much of what you just said. Um, I think that one of the things that happens with trauma is that for me anyway, there, I think trauma is a lot like grief in some ways in that it's not like a straight line. It's much more of sort of a spiral and there's sort of, for me anyway, there's stages, you know, there's denial, there's sort of acceptance, there's, um, for me anyway, there's always a lot of compartmentalization 
in some ways, like, especially like at the beginning when it's sort of too much. And I think that's part of what, for me anyway, my experience of sort of what you were just saying, Michelle, about, you know, sort of having like a public version versus a private sort of experience um, where, you know, people had no idea. And I'm sure that most people, I actually, I'm sure that everyone who knew me at this period in high school, I had no idea that this was going on. Mm-hmm. Or if they did, they did not realize what was happening. Right. Um, exactly. Um, and sort of to get back to your question, Kira, when I was writing the book, I was much more conscious, like I made a choice that in part one and part two, I wanted to be as close to 17 and 18 year old Allison as I possibly could. Like I wanted to try to keep my point of view in the narrative. So again, like the idea of the eye as a construction, I wanted my eye to be as close to 17 and 18 year old Allison as I could sort of manifest. Um, And I did that through reading all of my high school journals from that period, which is like the most painful, embarrassing, awful thing to do. (laughs) Um, And took copious notes and like was marking things all over. Um, I went through photographs. I have a box of letters and um, hotel receipts and all hall passes. I have all this stuff from the relationship, which I don't think is the right word, but that's the word. I use because I don't really think there is a correct word for that. But um, I really did my due diligence in sort of trying to really lean onto these primary sources, including the photograph. And um, that's being that you were just mentioning, which is this photograph of me backstage during a school play. And I remembered at the time feeling like so sexy and like powerful. And like, I remember him looking at me and you know, having this moment where I was like, ooh, I'm in control. And then I found the photograph and I look so young and so sad and not at all like I remembered. And that was really a moment for me when I became so aware that who I, my experience at the time was absolutely not accurate. And that was also part of what I wanted to capture and sort of let the reader go on that experience with me as opposed to just being like, well, this is what happened and it was awful. Like, first off, that's a boring story. And I also don't think that's true because that wasn't my experience. And I think something with that can happen with trauma is you can sort of experience it. You can then sort of try to process it and then come out at a different way on the other side. I don't know if that was sort of both of your experiences in some ways, but you know, I'm 36. It was almost 20 years ago now that this happened. And I feel very differently about what happened to me now than I did at the time. I thought I was the luckiest girl in the world. I thought it was just so wonderful. And I really tried to capture that in the book. Thank you. On that note, um, I'm always asked by students, how do you write about trauma? Are there any tools of writing about trauma? And how do you know when you're ready to write about that trauma? Um, I'm wondering if you had any advice to those who might be watching or listening who want to tell their stories, um, whether that's literal tools on the page of pacing, uh, of holding separate stories at the same time, or timelines, or just self-care routines uh, for writing stories like these. Because while there is so much hope and so much joy in both of your books, um, you do both really get to the thing. There There are really difficult and graphic scenes um, and I just wonder how, how that went for you as a writer and as a person. Do you want to take this one first, Michelle? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I would say, you know, sometimes I, I say, and I, I mean it, that I couldn't have written this book one second sooner than I did. Um, and and it took me a long time to figure out what would be in it and what wouldn't be in it. Every decision I made was intentional. And, um, and I surprised myself with some of the decisions that I made. I felt like I wanted to go past certain things and sort of brush over details that I thought would be really, really hard for people to read. And then I decided that Uh, Again, I couldn't ask people to understand the devastation if they actually didn't understand what happened. And they couldn't just minimize it as some 
miscommunication uh, between people who just, you know, no big deal. And so, so I guess I would say with writing trauma, you really, you have to be ready. Sometimes you think you're ready and you decide you're not ready. It's helpful if you've done some trauma work. It's helpful if you have done, so by that I mean therapy, and, um, and that you are maybe not the only person you know in the world who's experienced something like this, so that you understand that you're not alone and that you can at least know that other people uh, can hear and see you. Um, and that it's okay to stop. It's okay to, I mean, if I spent too long on certain scenes, I and mean, I think this last year I ate a lot of ice cream and took a lot and, and we got another dog and, you know, there were like some things of joy that we added in, um, me and my, me and my wife to sort of make it tolerable to do the revisions and then particular scenes and then you have to edit again and then you have to edit again and um and it also helped that i had a really good team i felt like uh the editor that i had uh at flat iron was so sensitive and, and 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 you know you you get to figure out in advance when you take this step if you're going to publish um who your editor is going to be and you have to pick really carefully so that somebody isn't pushing you to do something that you don't want to do and that you maintain a sense of control. And that was a long answer, but that's how I feel, feel strongly about it. I completely agree. I, I really do. I completely agree. Whenever my students, because I teach nonfiction and a lot of my students are women, which I love, um, but I think that so many women's lives ha are full of trauma and violence and um, and I think that's in part because of patriarchy as a short answer, but also because of all these other socially constructed things about power and uh, gender and violence. And whenever I have a student who is working, especially if it's a bigger project, especially if it's a bigger project, but even like an essay that has to do with something traumatic, my first piece of advice is therapy, therapy, therapy. Like, you need to be in therapy if you're working. I believe, I believe you need to be in therapy if you're working on something difficult. Because, and again, this is based on my own experience, but I think this is good advice. Um, if you're writing a big project, um, while well, writing is very therapeutic, um, I've talked, one of my favorite writers who writes about this is Melissa Phoebos. She has this amazing, amazing essay called um, On Navel Gazing, and it's about women writing memoir. It's called The Heart Work. You can find it online. It's a fantastic essay. And she talks a lot about how, you know, it's, it's hard for women to write memoir and there are these expectations about women writing memoir. And I believe that while writing is a very therapeutic process and can be, when you're writing for publication, for a reader, for an audience, it, it's completely different. That's right. You, know? you can't be prioritizing yourself and your process, like emotional process, you have to be thinking about a reader. You have to be ready to edit, which means sometimes, you know, the phrase is killing your darlings. And sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta do some tough work. Um, and I think if you're writing for a reader for publication, you need to have already processed mm -hmm. what you're writing about or else it's just too hard and you can't take criticism. You can't, you know, step away from it and see it. Um, so I really believe in that. And I have been in therapy this entire time um, <laughs> when I cannot, you know, I, I thanked my therapist in the acknowledgments. Um, you know, I mean, I think being in therapy is so important. Just like you, Michelle, I also know, Kira, you have a similar uh, experience is that I surrounded myself by other women writers who have not only been through similar things, they have empathy, they're good writers they're smart i know that i can trust them not only as like people but also as um as readers and as you know people who support me even if that sometimes means like hey you gotta you gotta rework this chapter or you know yeah. you're not leaning in hard enough um and when it comes to writing trauma you know <laughs> three of my published my first sort of three like big published pieces 
were all about the worst things that have ever happened to me. <laughs> They're all trauma pieces, um, which isn't exactly how I wanted. It's not a conscious thing. It's not what I wanted to write about. I would like to write about strong women. I would like to write about, you know, uh, these powerful female friendships and how, you know, I'll, I want to write about good things, kittens and unicorns. But nope, I write about trauma because that's what feels urgent, because that's what feel, feels important to me. And I feel like it, I have to talk about it or write about it. And when I was writing my pieces, I'm an underwriter when it comes to trauma. I really think it's important to create space for the reader to have their own experience of the situation of what's, of what's unfolding. I never want to tell my reader how to feel. Um, I really try not to do that. I don't want to, and in writing memoir, I want to be true. And of course, memory is faulty, you know, part of why I really lean on primary source documents whenever I can. But I really want to be fair and I want to leave space for the reader to make their assessment and have their own reaction. And as for like self care, I mean, when I was writing the really hard chapters, I just sort of get through them. I barrel through them. Like I write them sort of like all in one sitting. And then I can't like write them piece by piece. I sort of have to just get through it. Um, and sometimes it'll take me a long time to get there. Like some of the chapters in the book that contain some of, frankly, the most shameful, like embarrassing, like painful things. Um, those were chapters that I waited. Those were chapters <laughs> that were the, some of the last chapters that I wrote because they were just so hard. Um, and, you know, I think Michelle, just like you, I got two, two kittens this past year. So, <laughs> you know, you find the joy, you, um, again, a lot of ice cream, um, a lot of my favorite foods, you know, you just sort of have to do what you have to do. And I'm just so lucky that I have such a wonderful community of other women writers and Tikira, you've been a wonderful support this entire time. And, you know, I'm just, I'm very lucky in that respect, but that's, that's what I've done. And can I just make one comment about that, 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 I, I guess I guess just for the record, I want to say that um, we've also that that we haven't just written and 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 this is obvious, but I, I need to say it that we've all written books that have structure, that have characters, that have an arc, that have that have meaning, and that just because you write about trauma doesn't mean that that's what that's ultimately what the book is about yeah. the book is about so much it's it's a piece of what you're writing but it is it doesn't define us and it doesn't define our books you know i just i just feel that it's important to say that that's important to me yeah i complete i completely agree and that's something that melissa fibos talks about in that in that essay the heart work um writing yeah. about trauma as a subversive act that's the essay yeah and, you know, she talks so much about that, about how she's not just writing, she's not writing out her diaries, mm -hmm. you know, she's not just writing about this because she has feelings about it, she's mm -hmm. crafting it, it right. is conscious work, um, right. and I know that all three of us poured ourselves, like, not just as, like, you know, what happened, but, like, <laughs> as writers, right. being thoughtful, making intentional choices, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think, I think you're absolutely right. That's a really important distinction. And I think that's something that I think in particular with women's memoir, with memoir in general, but I, I really do feel like with women's memoir, it gets undermined by yeah. talking about it that way. Like, oh, it's just about something bad that happened. And it's like, right. no, it's not. No. It's, mm -hmm. stuff, it's not just about that, but it's not just me having feelings and putting them on a page. Mm -hmm. No. And right. it was not for either of you. Thank you. Well said. Um, when I when my book came out, I was asked to write an essay um, to go along with publication, and the only essay I could write was called "Against Catharsis." I love that essay. I completely agree. Completely agree. Yeah. The first few weeks of oh, it must have been so cathartic, and that was the only. <laughs> oh. Or you must have done this to heal someone yeah. else at one of my first events. Do you think you could be a real writer now that you've published your diary? Um, and I think it's flattened in that way when we're writing about trauma. So thank you for, for talking about your crafting um, and the exquisite skill 
that it takes to write something like this, so, something so beautifully structured, so thoughtful, with such forward momentum of what now or the what of it. Um, I have one more, more question and then I'm gonna to move to the Q&A. So please put your questions in the Q&A if you haven't. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about uh, this idea of how we, how we frame stories like ours in terms of carceral justice and criminal justice. And I'm curious for, for both of you, how you currently think about a word like justice outside that carceral system. Um, yeah. And perhaps uh, what you'd ask of a reader with books like yours, books like ours, uh, moving forward. Michelle, you have this beautiful metaphor at the end of your book about fixing the bridge, finding the root, um, and what that looks like for both of you. Michelle, can you go first? I really want to hear sure. what you okay. yeah. Sure. Um, so I really, it, I'm so glad you asked that question because I have the word crime in my title and it was important to talk about how the lack of response by law enforcement is egregious, but maybe part of the issue is that they shouldn't be the ones who we look to to try to fix this problem. I mean, I think that's something we can all really think about. I do believe that one of the core problems um, for anybody who's working with a, 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 a somebody who's experienced a trauma is a belief that something is being asked of them other than what is actually being asked of them. And so for me, um, what would have mattered, I'm, and I can, I, so I, this is, a, it is a metaphor. This is what I would have liked. And I, I don't know if this is what everyone would have liked, but I do believe that the current system is flawed because what it what it does to law enforcement is it creates they're judged by doing their jobs about whether they solve a crime and whether they win a case and they all believe that rape cases can't be won or solved and so they don't even and they don't even really care so they don't really try anymore yeah. and i think about the difference it would have made to me if and even at the most basic level, the person that I was talking to listened, responded, understood the trauma, and was helpful in thinking about what resources I might need next. Um, and that they weren't afraid to contact me because they didn't think they could solve the crime and they didn't want to give me bad news, as opposed to, this is what we did, this is what we tried to do. We're really sorry this happened. And what do you need now? And you know, we actually know about a lot of supports that are out there, like a victim compensation fund. Yeah. Um, they were not the people who talked to me about that. And so, and so I think, you know, people talk about restorative justice, and I'm not an expert on it, but I do feel like before we talk about restorative justice, we, we can't think of it as a solution if we, if we don't also offer a strong critique of the current criminal justice system and ask them to be accountable to victims. Um, because I think if we, if we jump too fast to, to an alternative, um, it doesn't hold them accountable in a certain way. And maybe that is just that we, we don't provide them funding to solve things and do something that they're really bad at doing. So. I think that's that's about all I have to say about that, but I probably have more to say later. <laughs> <laughs> I agree uh, with all of that. Um, I, you know, I think also for my book, it's tricky because technically for most of what happened in the book, most was actually never technically a crime. It was immoral. It was incredibly unethical um, and it was just wrong. But especially now as a teacher myself, the fact that the boundaries that were crossed were crossed by a high school teacher to me when I was 17 is just, when I, be, when I began teaching, like I, I have to say, when I, began te when I began teaching undergrads and undergrads are just, you know, a little bit older than I was, they're 18, 19, you know, they're still, they're still kids in a lot of ways, you know? And that's not to like disavow their maturity or agency or intelligence, but they're still kids, you know, they've never worked. Most of them have never worked full time or lived on their own or all these things. 
and I think teaching is so sacred. I mean, I really do. I think teaching is a sacred, so important thing to do. And I take it so seriously. And the things that my teacher did, especially when I was still in high school, like are egregious and the kind of boundary crossing that should be illegal. It should be, you know, like that he shouldn't have just gotten fired. He should have, but <laughs> that, that should be illegal. It should be, I think even in the college system, you know, it should be made clear professors cannot date their students, cannot. Most colleges do not actually have those rules. There's lots of exceptions. Well, you know, whatever, even at graduate level. Um, in my graduate program, there was a professor who was dating a girl in my cohort. Um, and that's just fine. And, you know, it, it just, it drives me, it drives me nuts. Um, I have very strong feelings about that. Um, but sort of to go back to your question about justice, you know, as someone who is, who was also raped in a different circumstance, um, years later when I was, I meant, I talk about this in the book when I was raped by my boss at work and I've written about this, um, as well, uh, in the New York times, um, five years ago. So it was before me too. So it was a very different time to write an essay about being raped um, and have it be published um, in some place like the New York Times. And nothing happened with that case. I remember I finally, like a week later, got up the nerve to report it. I contacted some sort of victim's advocate uh, thing in, in the city where this happened. And so this lovely woman came with me to report what had happened because I was, I was scared and I was very intimidated. And I didn't really know what to say. Um, and she came with me, which was so wonderful. And I found that resource myself, but you know, when it comes to restorative justice, I'm a big believer in restorative justice. I really am. I've done restorative justice work before. I did nonprofit for about 10 years before I sort of switched and started doing writing. So one of the things I did was restorative justice. I worked for a juvenile justice Alliance. I did that work. But the thing is, I think that with rape and sexual assault and predators, right. it's not the same. You know, yeah. it's not like a broken window. It's not stealing. Yeah. It's, there's no repair. You can't fix the window. You can't return the car in better condition. You can't do that bridge work. For me, for justice with that is for those people to not be able to do that anymore. And for me, that, that does mean jail yeah. um, or just being something you know and i think it's so much also like you know this is this goes into your book michelle but you know we don't treat uh people who do this like they're criminals you know they get passed around um think about priests with churches um the person who raped me they knew that that had happened before and he had gotten transferred so um, my teacher allegedly did this again and the school found out, but this time instead of firing him or having there be some sort of like big, you know, kerfuffle, they just did not renew his contract. So like no one ever knew. And that, but that's just how we deal with this. We just sort of pass the trash. No one's accountable. No one takes responsibility for it. So just like you're saying, Michelle, like the systems in place don't work at all. Yeah. It is completely broken. And the fact that there are so many rape DNA kits that have just never been done. I mean, it's just, it's egregious. Yeah. I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I do think that the police force as it is do a terrible job at dealing with this. They're just like you're saying, they're not good at giving victims resources. They're not good at prosecuting or taking these things seriously. Um, you know, it's so frustrating when it's he said, she said, but why is it always his? word that's counted so it's not actually he said she said there's no even then there's no equality right so it's uh, i think we three could talk about this a lot <laughs> and it really breaks down having a term like he said she said and the problem with that uh right in the front of the book um thank you for for wrestling with that question i know it's a difficult one um increasingly difficult because it is sometimes hard to, to separate the politics from the lived experience and what the laws mean for, for people like us, uh, for people who have faced these atrocities. And I know that there, it takes an enormous amount of empathetic imagination to think about what this means 
going forward and we don't have those neat answers, but thank you for, for kind of showing yeah. the process, thinking through it. Um, I have one more thing that I know, Michelle, you talk about this a little bit in your book, but just the fact that so many predator, predators and rapists and sexual assault perpetrators, it's a serial crime. It doesn't just yeah. happen for the most part. It does not just happen once. It right. happens repeatedly. Yeah. And this also goes for, you know, for priests, for things. It, it's not just a one-time thing. And this is also why I think the, t the discussion of restorative justice with that breaks down for me a bit, because for me, the, res the restoration is to know that this is not going to happen again. Yeah. And there's so little to do about that. And that's just so difficult and something that I struggle with, you know, none of my students have known what I was working on because the book wasn't published and, I, you know, I'm not teaching at the moment. So I haven't had a classroom where my students knew about this book or had read any of it. But every single semester, there's at least one girl, sometimes a few, who at some point reveal either in a poem or in a piece and or in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, because I really try to make it clear that I am a safe space that, you know, I will, if they are struggling with things, they can tell me and then I will, I will refer them to the, to the right places and I will, you know, contact people on their behalf, you know, because it's not my job, but I want to support them by getting them to the right places. So I feel like a lot of my students talk to me, which I value so much and I take that, I take that responsibility so seriously, but I feel like, not I feel like every single semester, there's at least one, if not more girls who reveal to me at some point, they were sexually harassed by a male in power, they were raped, they were sexually assaulted by coaches, by instructors, by tutors, by teachers. And it's just so heartbreaking. It's just so heartbreaking because, and this is sort of also getting into what you were saying, Kira, from my own personal experience, I know they're not the only ones. And I think that's something that I really tried to also address in my book that I felt so special. I thought that like he loved me, that I was just so special, that like it was beyond age and you know, it trans, it, but I wasn't special. There was nothing special about me in how he preyed upon me. There was nothing special about that. And that was something that was sort of hard to, to once I understood that, that really gave me a whole new layer of insight into my experience. And also going back to your question about, I, I love your essay on catharsis because I'm already getting that question all the time about catharsis, well, isn't this cathartic? And I'm like, no, no, this was hard work. This was like, we're all talking about, this was crafted, this was intellectual, this was hard, hard work. Emotionally, yes, but also just like, as a writer, you know, as a professional, this was hard work. And yes, this gave me so much more understanding of what happened, but it didn't make it better. It didn't fix it, you know? Yeah. yeah. It fixes everything except dialogues like these, conversations like these, and the conversations you'll both have that I'm sure you're already having with readers who find this work. Um, that helps with that meaning making that we're talking about. It doesn't fix the trauma that lives in the body, but it helps with that meaning making for me. Um, I'm going to combine a few questions as a final question. Um, Okay, is there a book in your writing lives that stands out as having helped shape your voice or approach to writing? Um, I want to extend that to a book or perhaps an instructor or a specific writer. And also there's a lot of what is next for both of you. Uh, if you're thinking in terms of more nonfiction or maybe switching genres or if there's any project on your mind and it's also very much okay if that is not the case because I could not answer this question. Um, and I really couldn't start writing again until recently. So, okay. do you have an answer, Michelle? I do. I do. Okay. I surprisingly do. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to say, Virginia Woolf? But then I thought about something else. So, so okay. I would say that one of the writers who has influenced me throughout, from the time I was in college, is Carson McCullers. Mm. Um, I. I found as soon as I started reading her and particularly in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, um, I found that she had a way of writing short but gorgeous sentences and that they were accessible and that her 
thing. Someone just said, I love Carson. Oh my God, I do. <laughs> and, and, and I, I also felt like the characters, I mean, this, she's a fiction writer, but, um, I just, I just, I, I was deeply influenced by, by her. And then in terms of present day, I would have to say my instructor in, at Grub Street, Alex Marzano Lesnovich, who, you know, what, what people don't know about me is that, you know, I wanted to have a career in writing. I was an editor, an assistant editor of a magazine after I was assaulted, and my life just went in a totally different direction. And so to be in my 50s and say, hey, you know what, I think, I'll, I think I'm going to try to get back to writing, you know, a few years ago and be here now, I actually attribute to them. I feel like um, they provided so much information about what creative nonfiction was and so much support where um, a write, you know, I'm not a writing uh, instructor, but this, I, I knew that in order to do the work that we all had to do in our group, we had to feel safe and we had to trust one another. And the space that Alex created was that space. And I will always be grateful to them. And um, and also they're an amazing writer. So that, that, so that's, that's me. And I don't know what's next, but I do want to continue to talk about these issues and, um, and continue writing in some capacity and, and, and hopefully, you know, make the manifesto, not just be something I wrote about once, but to really work for change. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, to answer sort of the first half of the question, obviously when I was writing the book, Lolita was very influential. Um, but uh, as, as a writer, I, um, I mean, the first really influential book for me was Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar. I, I mentioned that in, in the book. That was a book that I read when I was in high school and I was just like, oh, beautiful sentences. You know, it can be, you can be honest, even though again, it's a novel, but it's so, and it's so deep, uh, deeply, there's so much empathy, which I love in that book. I think that's such a wonderful book about teaching empathy, um, using language and using structure. And, um, but, you know, some of my favorite writers that I think really influenced me in writing this book are so many of the other women and queer memoirists out there doing these amazing things, including you, T. Kira. I mean, you know, Melissa Phoebos, who I was, uh, lucky enough to get to work with at Tin House, um, Paul Lissicky, uh, Garrett Conley. I also, I love Maggie Nelson, um, Bluettes. I think it's just so beautiful and like, uh, it's just such a gut punch. Um, and I also really, I, I'm a huge fan of Leslie Jameson's work. And when I first started working on the book, I had only read um, The Empathy Exams, that collection, and The Grand Unified Theory of Female Pain, one of her essays in there. Um, it just, it really made me feel like I can write about pain and trauma and it can still be beautiful and brilliant and smart and all these wonderful things. Um, and I, somehow I got to do a conversation with her for the Paris Review and I still am, um, oh, I can't believe that that happened. Um, I still can't believe that that happened because she's just so, she's one of my heroes. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of, I really looked to other people who are writing memoir right now as people to sort of model and trust Hannah Tinty and um, Darren Strauss, half a life, I yeah. think just one of the you know, I mean, that opening line, half my life, I, kill, I killed a girl. How do you not keep reading? <laughs> um, so I just, I think I just had some really wonderful mentors and examples to work from. And I think that's something that's so wonderful that's happening in writing now, that there's all these powerful voices telling these stories that are so important and impactful and telling them beautifully, you know? I just think I'm, I'm, I feel like we're so lucky to be having this happen right now, you know, that we are we, like, we three are just, we've been given the opportunity to write these books and to publish these books, you know, that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. I don't think I really don't. Yeah. And I just think we're in such a wonderful time in that respect. And I'm just so grateful to be 
in a time and a place when I can be here with you too. I just think that's so, so important. Um, and what I'm working on next, I'm working on a novel. Um, it's my first novel, so we'll see how it goes. Um, but I'm also, you know, I'm still writing essays. I still have a lot of, I still have a lot to say about what happened to me that's connected to the book. Um, and I think I'm always gonna be writing about gender and power. I think that's just what I'm always gonna be writing about. So maybe kittens and unicorns too, but <laughs> it'll be somehow power and gender in those kittens and unicorns, somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much uh, for this conversation, for your gorgeous books. Um, everyone, please order these books. They're so important. Um, they're just mesmerizing and so educational. Uh, order these books. And thank you so much to Politics and Prose for hosting conversations like this. Um, it's, it's so important, and I feel really lucky that all of us can share a space in, in this Zoom box uh, where we may been able to share space in the real world. So there are there are some some pros to the situation that we can sit here together and have, I'm sure, so many people in the audience who might not necessarily share a town or space with us. So thank you all for joining us and thank you, Brittany. Thank you all so much. Someone wrote, um, I lost it, but someone wrote in the Q&A, like to you strong, powerful, intelligent, fully alive women. I'm so happy to be here with you. And I think that sums up how I feel perfectly. Um, I have dropped like a thousand links in the chat <laughs> for all the books that they recommended, all of the um, essays that they recommended. Um, and for P&P, &P, we're offering $5 shipping no matter how many books you add to your cart. So you should probably just add them all. Uh, and um, thank you all so much. This, this conversation is so important to me and important to so many people. Um, and thank you for, for writing about it and putting it out into the world. Thank you. Thank you all for listening and for being part of this. And congratulations again, Allison. And, and really, thank you for the opportunity. And Tika, those were wonderful questions. So thank you all. Thank you all, everybody. Everyone. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Read on. <laughs> Bye.